Hey there, sewing friends. Welcome back to another video with Emporium Threads. My name is Ray, and today we are going to be customizing a cam press. All right, so if you have never heard of a cam press before, this is a multifunction tool that punches holes and sets all kinds of different hardware for us, such as rivets, grommets, um, again, you know, can poke holes through our materials. We use these all the time if we are pretty much installing any kind of hardware that has to be set. Now, if you haven't invested in one of these, I know a lot of people are on the fence about them, but I absolutely love mine, highly recommend it. Camsnaps.com is where I purchased mine and I will be linking that in the comments for you um, or in the description rather below so that you can get your own press if you've been looking for one. Now, my only pet peeve really with this press is that pretty much only comes in this really, um, I don't know how I would explain it, depressing Christmas color combination. So we have this kind of red portion here with like the red logo, but it's not really like a nice, pretty cheery red. It's kind of a dreary orangey red. And then we've got this um, really green color. I like green, I just don't really love this shade, and the color combination together just makes me think of cheap Christmas decor. Uh, so that being said, I wanna change this up and I'm gonna show you how to do that today. So follow along with me if you want to get rid of your drab, gross green colored press and make it something that will fit your space and style. Okay, so to start off with here, I have got my cam press to the side so that hopefully you can see. We're gonna start dissecting this. We're gonna take it all apart so that we can clean it and then so we can paint it and make sure that everything sticks well, is prepped well, all that good stuff. So the first thing I'm gonna do, if you have any of these bases, these adapter bases and dies, we're gonna remove those right off the bat. We're not gonna do anything with those. So pull those out, set them aside, we don't need them. Let's take out this little adjuster screw here. This should just be able to be pulled right out um, by just spinning it by hand. If you need tools, there is a Phillips head here and our nut should just come out with this, uh, with this screw here. Get myself a little bin to put my pieces in. I don't wanna lose any of these. Now, if you need to take pictures to remember how this cam press goes together, do that. There are plenty on the internet, but it might be a little difficult to figure out how it comes apart. I'm actually gonna turn this up here so it might be a little difficult to see. I'm now going to take this piece off here, the handle, by taking off this nut and then hand unscrewing this piece. I'm just gonna set that handle aside. Put that there. Next thing I'm gonna do is take my screwdriver and take out this little side screw here. Okay, now to loosen my, my spring and this little peg here, I'll need to get the peg out so that I can get this black shaft piece out and then get the spring out. Alternatively, you could choose to tape these things off, but I don't wanna do that. I wanna do this the right way and I want it to look a certain way in the end. So I'm going to disassemble everything. Um, I think in the end with a little bit of muscle, I'll be able to get it all back together. You may need um, a screwdriver and a hammer here as a little peg to get this open. We may actually need to put our handle back on and compress this just a little bit in order to get that peg out because it is under tension when our handle's not on it. So we're gonna play that by ear. You know, you're kind of learning along with me while I pull this guy apart. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just try to pull this guy out. My little peg here that they've used to hold this spring in has a bend on this side where it was inserted and cut off at the factory. So I'm not gonna wanna pull this way. I'm gonna wanna get it out this way. So the first thing I'm gonna try is just to um, lightly hammer this out. And I might try using a little screw to get that out. We'll see how much under tension it is. I just have a very small jeweler's hammer here that I keep in my room. I may need to go get the real hammer. We'll see how this goes. Okay, that actually moved pretty well and it's already almost out. Let's 
see if we can just pull it a little bit. There we go. Got it out. That has caused the shaft here to fall all the way down, exposing the hole in which it goes. So I'm actually just going to pull all the way from the bottom. And before I really disassemble this, I'm gonna see how under tension this spring is just to make sure I can actually get it back in there if I think that I can. The other thing that I'm gonna do, uh, I've got some zip ties. So since this is exposed now, what I think I might do is tuck a couple of zip ties in here and try to compress this a little bit with some zip ties. That way I should be able to just reinsert it. If I can get this under tension enough, I'll do that on one side. Do it on the other side. Now be careful, you know, again, this is under tension and we don't want to be like breaking stuff, hitting ourselves in the eye. That's your safety disclaimer there. So I'm going to equally zip tie both sides of this and get it under tension just a little bit so that I can slip it in and out easily when I'm done later. Get most of my slack out. Most of my slack out there. And then I'm just gonna hope that this will be strong enough to compress this just a tiny bit. Okay, so I have now compressed this spring just a little. You can kind of see it there under tension. I could get a bigger one and compress it just a little more. And I can also pull it by hand a little bit like that now that it's out. Okay, and so we'll just keep it like that. And so now you can see that it's under tension a little bit. I can get it in and out without too much of a fuss. So we will set this aside because we're also not gonna paint or touch that. Okay, so a couple of things that we don't wanna do at this stage, we do not want to soak our rivet press, any portions of the rivet press that are not currently coated. We can see there are some here. They may rust. Uh, this is, I'm not sure exactly what type of metal this is, but I am almost willing to bet that much like a cast iron pan or anything like that, um, that is not, you know, seasoned, coated, sealed from rust, it might rust. So we don't wanna cause any rust. We don't want any rust on here. If you currently have rust on yours anywhere, go ahead and remove it before we paint by simply cleaning up your piece. There are a few different ways to remove rust. I don't currently have any, but what I am gonna do is use this 409 um, and I'm just gonna give my cam press a little light spritz. This is gonna take off any hand oils that I have gotten on my press through the time of using it, also remove any dust and particulates, but also 409 removes grease. So if we've got any grease on here, um, it'll just kind of help us remove and clean up anything that is on our press that we don't want. There could even be a little bit of grease hidden here and there from the factory. We've also got some loose paint dust we can see transferring onto our napkins. Um, I'm using these napkins just because they're kind of a wood pulpy style material and I find that they're actually really good for lint-free cleaning. So I always keep my napkins around from most restaurants. We're gonna go through and just Gently clean off everything. Don't shred your napkin or else, you know, you'll have lint all over there, all over everything. Really make sure to give your press handle a good clean because that's the thing, you know, you're really touching all the time and we want that to be super clean. Prep work is really important. To getting paint to stick nicely. If you notice anywhere on your cam press that you have a, a sharp bit, I don't think I have any on mine, but sometimes on metal items, you might have a little pokey bit from the mold process or just slight damage or something like that. Um, you can take a metal file and you can grate that piece down. Now would be the time to do that before painting. Anything that you don't like about your pieces, 
right now is the opportunity to go ahead and file those bits down because we're going to be covering this in paint and so any wearing off of the paint that we do we'll be covering it nicely. Alright, so we've got our basic cleaning done. The next thing that we're going to do is actually take these bits out to the garage where I will be painting. I would highly suggest uh, we are going to be using spray paint for this. You will want to be in a ventilated area. I could recommend wearing a mask. I am not going to because I'm in a well ventilated area where I'm going to be painting, but definitely do not do this in your house or in your craft room unless you have a dedicated space where you can deal with the paint over spray because it is a bit of a messy job. I'm going to show you my setup of where I will be painting. All right, we have relocated to the garage. I'm going to apologize right now for the terrible lighting, lack of atmosphere, general clutteredness, and probable sounds that are going to come from outside. Um, you know, obviously we've got neighbors, probably going to be some cars, dogs barking. Also, super windy day out here. So that is reason number two why I am painting in here, but I do have the door open on that side. It is ventilated really well in here and there's a ton of wind going on. So what I have here though is a reasonably sized cardboard box. Any cardboard box or even a tote that you don't mind ruining or using for spray paint works great for this. So I have it all kind of set up in here to just sort of show you before I kind of start blocking the camera a little bit. But basically we're gonna utilize this box we're going to set one piece at a time in here and we're going to go ahead and paint and when we set things back in the box like this it actually helps to uh, curb our over spray going all over the place and it actually helps us get a better paint job because we don't have um, you know drafts and as much you know issues with like wind going across but also when you spray you have a little bit of those particles left over right spray that doesn't make contact with the item so that is um, if you put it in the box some of those errant particles of spray paint actually still end up on our project so it cuts down on the amount of paint that you use too it's just a little makeshift version of a paint booth. I opted to go with Rust-Oleum products, not because I am affiliated with them or sponsored by them in any way. The base color I am choosing for my press is the Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X Ultra Cover. It's a paint and primer in one. It does bond to metal. Um, Rust-Oleum products, in my experience, have a really good shelf life bonding to metal, especially on heavy duty use items and outdoor products. So I highly recommend going with these. The color I am using is Ocean Mist and I'm actually gonna use a gloss. I'm using a gloss because I am also going to be utilizing a glitter top coat. But if you do not seal this glitter top coat, you end up with glitter transfer all over the place, which no one wants. I don't want my glitter coming off over time. So I'll be using a base coat of color once I'm completely finished with all of the base coat and it is solid and looks good, I'll move on to using a light mist of the glitter. After that has dried, I'm actually gonna be using a high gloss top coat called Triple Thick Glaze. Triple Thick Glaze is um, just a really shiny, really nice, gives it a pottery-like finish. And I'm gonna be putting that over my glitter to avoid glitter transfer. First thing I am going to do when I start to paint is actually hit up these red areas on my handle and the red logos on my cam press that are both on um, each side. I'm going to do that because this is a pretty light color and I want that red color to disappear. And I'm not going to use a primer because this is a paint and primer in one. So I am just going to go ahead and lightly hit this up, lightly hit up the other side, set it aside, and then we'll hit the red parts and kind of continue on. Uh, 
All right, so I have used about a third of my can of spray paint and I've been doing lots of little coats here and there on my press from all different angles. I have flipped it on, you know, its side and the bottom and just kind of done very light coats. I don't have any runs. So I am really happy with this and it's not tacky anymore. There's a couple of spots I feel that are lightly tacky and I definitely need another coat here. You can see that that red part is still showing through a little bit compared to over here. And that's the other side that's been hit a few times. So I am gonna hit this one one more time and set it aside, let that dry. Next step for this, for me, is going to be a really light coat of this glitter. I saw this in the store. I thought it was really pretty. This is the purple shimmer, but it's just glitter with clear coat. So the, the glitter is a purpley color. And now I am going to start hitting this with the coats of the triple thick um, because this glitter is dry to the touch. It's really more of just a spray on, you know, a spray on glitter. Some of it does stick, but with a gentle rub, a lot of it does want to come off. And I don't want that. I don't want it in my craft room. So that is our purpose for this. And we'll see how well it shines afterwards light coats of this one, really light coats of this. I get the feeling that this one is gonna stay tacky for quite some time. We really don't wanna mess that up. So we're gonna leave this and probably not rotate it for a couple of hours. Um, Glosses kind of tend to be that way, like a clear gloss. They go on a little thick, even with these thin coats. But I really, again, want to make sure that all my hard work is protected as best as possible. So I want a nice thick layer on this. I'm just going to keep hitting it up. Honestly, I'll probably use half to two thirds of this can, maybe even more, just hitting this thing repeatedly, repeatedly with this clear coat to get it to stay on nice. So for the last portion of this tutorial, we're actually going to be making a little handle cover I have some super stretchy knit material here. For the material you're gonna use, I would suggest something like a sweater knit with good elasticity, um, a French terry, a cotton lycra, um, a bamboo if you wanted, definitely something with stretch to it. That way we can stretch over the kind of very um, sort of fluid, lumpy, bumpy shape of this handle. Now you can obviously do your handle any way you want, kind of covering the entire thing. You can just cover the middle section. I am going to just opt to cover the middle section and make kind of like a little decorative sort of strip for my handle here. So I have this um, super cute button material that I'm gonna be using. And the first thing you're gonna wanna do is find the grain of your material. So there's gonna be um, the way that stretches with the little ribs you can see here. So the grain of this is running this way. So I am gonna go ahead and just fold this corner. That way I can see pretty good. And I'm gonna fold it over right sides together so I can cut two mirror images of each other, okay? So I'm gonna lay that down trying to keep it on grain, but honestly for this project, we're not wearing it. We don't really care that much. So I'm gonna take my handle and I'm gonna lay this right here in the middle. Now, we're gonna end up tracing this, but we need to sort of make a little sleeve here that will fit over all four sides. So kind of like wrapping a Christmas present. So we can't just cut it to being the same size as this because that would only cover the back side and the front side. We need to allow for enough um, give on here that we can sort of wrap up the sides as well. So the first thing I am gonna do is trace out my handle with a pen. Um, just on the wrong side here and I'm going to I want my sleeve ultimately to end up right about here in the middle Right, but I'm gonna add a little bit of extra length that way. I can sort of hem the raw edges uh, While I am sewing this so I think we'll start and stop 
right about there. That'll give me a little bit extra fabric. I am going to sort of generally trace out the size and side uh, and shape of my handle here. And then just kind of eyeballing this. Um, you, know, you can measure and get real scientific if you want to. This is a little over a half inch thick. We'll be generous and say it's three quarters of an inch thick. Um, I really don't think it is. I think it's right below three quarter of an inch. So I think with seam allowances, if I add about a half inch to each side of this, I should be okay. And I'm just, honestly, I'm gonna eyeball that. So I'm just gonna kind of make some marks out here following the general shape of my pattern. Again, we're not wearing this. We're not trying to get real scientific here. And we're using a stretch material. So I think we'll end up being okay. And then, um, you know, we, we wanted it to sort of end, we made our marks here and here, and we're gonna fold it under just about a quarter of an inch on either side, and that should make our make up our little sleeve. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut both of these pieces out, the back and the front that I have folded over here. So I've got two mirrors of each other, and then I'm just gonna make some cuts here. Cut this guy out. So I now have two pieces here that are mirrors of each other. So the next thing that I'm gonna do for this is pin it into place a little bit. I'm just going to fold down the raw edge about a quarter of an inch, a generous quarter of an inch, I think, just through you know, one side here. And then I'm gonna fold up the bottom just the same, about a quarter of an inch. Now, you can do this on your regular sewing machine. I prefer to use my serger. So I'll just be serging. I'm gonna fold both edges, top and bottom like this, and I'm actually gonna do the same on this side toward the wrong side so that both pieces look just like this. And I'm gonna end up surging down the edge here and I'm gonna try a quarter of an inch seam allowance first and then I'm gonna test fit that. And if I need to take off a little bit more, I'll off a little bit more and I'm just gonna kind of do that. Now, if you're using your regular sewing machine, I would do a zigzag stitch or possibly a straight stitch reinforced on the edges with a zigzag stitch. Um, you may have some better stretch um, stitches on your machine, I just really prefer to use my serger on this kind of stuff. Anything stretchy, I get a way better result with my serger. Lay my little pieces back together here, and I'm just gonna fold this so it's even and pin it. This is a non-fraying material, and this is just a little you know, decorative item to kind of help Make it a little softer on my hand. So we're not gonna get too fancy with it. Just something fun. You could make these out of your scraps if you wanted and swap them out for holidays or when you get new cute little fabrics, just have something fun whenever you redecorate your sewing room. Definitely a fun little touch to have on our press. I'm gonna take this over to the serger go down both of these sides like this and then come back and do a little test fit on the handle. All right, so here is our freshly surged little sleeve here. I'm going to take a tapestry needle with a pretty large eye on it and I am going to just weave my tails in here. Don't have to, you can definitely just clip these or just tuck them inside the sleeve, but I prefer to tuck my tails on something like this, not through the fabric, just through our stitches here. Don't 
Don't need to pull it all the way through, just pull it through some. And then you can go ahead and trim off the excess there. So I'm gonna do that to all four of these. Here is a little tip for you on some of these shorter tails with a longer needle. Thread your needle in first into your stitches. And then after you've threaded your needle in, leave it poking out and go ahead and thread it just like that. And then you've already inserted here so you can go ahead and just pull all the way down. All right, moment of truth. Let's try to turn this and then thread it on our little handle. Now it's gonna be tight, it's supposed to be, but it's not supposed to be so tight that we can't work with it. Let's turn it through the bigger side. That would be the smarter way of doing it. We used this wonderful stretch material and we want it to be a little snug. We're making like a little, like a legging. We don't want baggy leggings, right? So we don't want a baggy sleeve on our little press sleeve or else when we go to do stuff, it'll be all over the place. And we don't want that. And now we're gonna try to test fit this on here. Let's see how we do, shall we? So we're gonna put it on through the skinny end like so, skinny end of this, but the fat end obviously of our sleeve. Be careful that the kind of bulbous end here, I don't wanna yank it through there, just be a little careful. If our little hem came out here, that's okay. Just go ahead and tuck it and then keep on pulling. And adjusting as we go. Oh my goodness. I think that is really, really cute. A little spare thread there. Definitely could have gone fancier with that, but I'm just not certain that we needed to. I think it's just a really cute way to dress up our press. So let's put our handle back on and look at our final, final result. After about a billion coats of base color, then a glitter spray, and then a clear coat, we are now back here at the table and we're ready to reassemble. So I'm not sure how well this glitter is gonna show up on camera, but I really love that extra little touch. I could have gone with just the flat color, but I opted to add that little bit of sparkle. Now, I did already say this, but I'm gonna say it again. If you're thinking about doing this and you're thinking about skipping that gloss coat over the top or whatever top coat you wanna use, don't do it. Um, the glitter spray paints are really just more of an aerosolized glitter. And if you know anything about glitter, as soon as you start touching anything covered in glitter, you're gonna be covered in it. Your project's gonna be covered in it. Your room will be covered in it. Um, this is not rubbing off on me at all because I have that uh, triple thick glaze coat over this entire project. So I'm hoping that not only will that keep the glitter sealed on, which it will, but it will um, help avoid chipping. And I did a million little individual, very light misty type coats. I just would do one spot and then let it dry for between 45 minutes, you know, to an hour. And I literally painted my press over two days. So I just set it up in the boxes you guys saw and would just kind of revisit it every once in a while going out there, um, touching in a spot that was very um, inconspicuous to make sure that it wasn't tacky and really that those layers had dried well. And then once you spray it, don't touch it, let it sit. So here's our finished result. I'm so excited about it. It looks so much prettier and it's obviously customized. So I'm really, really excited about that. Now, one more word about all of this, um, you know, when you're painting, I didn't say this before, but you wanna make sure, I mean, it's not a big deal if you get a little bit of overspray in a few of these holes, not a huge problem, but um, where this press assembles, you don't wanna get everything, um, all these small holes, just absolutely coated and gummed up with spray. A small overspray is not a big deal. You'll be able to push through that um, when you put the screws back in, put you know the pieces back in. But if they're totally gummed up with paint, 
which we were doing really light coats over and over, so we shouldn't have that problem if we're painting properly. But if you get the holes really gummed up, you're gonna have a bit of a hard time and you're gonna have to chip some of that out. Um, so if that is a problem that you ran into, I'm sorry I didn't say it before, but I don't tape things off like that because these holes are big enough, it shouldn't be a big problem. But just kind of a little bit of additional tip there for you. So I'm gonna try to um, reassemble this and remember how it goes. I will um, grab my grab my dies here and put those, you know, kind of off to the side. That's the last thing we're gonna end up putting back in. Obviously, my adapter is gonna go right back in. And you can see it's a little bit tighter of a fit than, you know, it previously kind of wanted to be because there is some paint in there. And that's something we have to watch out for. I'm gonna end up just tapping mine in, you know, with a hammer here and it'll be all right. Um, once it gets nested in there. But anyway, something we could run into just because we didn't tape off. All right. So I put my, uh, I put my, my peg all the way through here without spring. So it required me to get a couple of tools here to basically push my peg back down um, and hammer it through just so that I can get my spring back in. So once I do that, I'll be able to take these um, zip ties off. I'm just gonna clip them carefully once everything is really secured here. And because I was using the tools, I did, you know, get a couple of chips, that's okay. I was expecting that. Um, and we'll do some touch-ups with our spray paint afterwards. So I am just going to, very gently as possible, get this spring in its home here. We need to turn this and wiggle it a bit to get where I wanna be. This side might be a little better. Here we go. This is gonna take just a little, you know, finesse to get it up into place here. So I'm gonna push it just a little bit to get the spring in place and then I might have to hold it. Be careful that you don't pinch your fingers here. This spring is under tension, but our zip ties are helping keep it out of the way here. Press this a little more. And I'm also taking care to um, keep my channel lined up here with this hole on the side where it goes back in. Cause that's in my way. I'm hitting up against those. Carefully remove that. And I'll need to cut this other one here too, cause it is causing a little bit of resistance, but I've got my spring back into place where I needed it. So I'm comfortable cutting these, just be careful. Okay. So now it's kind of a crucial moment here, getting this back up in because you don't want to cause your spring to get out of place. So I also have a piece of just like foam here to help me uh, gently get this back into place. And I'm just gonna sorta whack this back into position. And it may take, you know, quite a bit of force to get it in there because we've kind of, um, you know, wedged it in a little bit with the paint and whatnot. Not too big of a deal, but I'm not gonna show you all that on camera, but I'll kind of keep whacking at it and get it back into place. Just be careful while you do it and try to keep everything all nice and lined up. All right, so I ended up getting this back into place with our little uh, spring here with, you know, pretty minimal damage. Again, we'll do some light touch ups at the end after everything is all finished and I'm done kind of rough housing with this. Um, I ended up just putting a die on here that I seldom use, but a die that I use nonetheless and just using that to lightly tap in with my hammer. Um, and it didn't really do a lot of damage to the die. Anything that I need to um, get out of there, I can just kind of lightly sand off. Um, I might suggest, you know, putting a piece of felt or something light over it, but that actually worked really well just for me to be able to tap that through. I've got it, you know, pretty close back into position here now. And I can see that my hole here for securing this guy is um, pretty much right where it needs to be. And to secure this spring back on, let me give that just a little tap. 
And so I want to line that up between that line of the spring and that is this little let the piece go this little um, peg piece here, just this little piece of like bent metal. So I'm going to pop that guy back in and then tap it back into place. coming all the way through here and so I'm gonna keep tapping and that secures it onto its spring. So we've got that all done. Next thing I'm gonna do is pop the screw for the handle. Um, it's basically like a positioning so that your handle doesn't go too far down or too um, not far down enough to squish your rivet or grommet or whatever you're setting. I'm going to put that back in here and we'll fidget with the settings on that in a little bit. Okay. Next we have uh, this guy and it's little nut which secures on our handle. So this guy goes just like that and we'll want to make sure that this is pressed down enough out of the way in order for us to secure our handle on. And all kind of lined up and kind of look through the holes here. There we go. All set. Just tighten that guy back on there. All right, and we're gonna give it a press and it does work. So now of course you've got to deal with our touch-ups, especially since I just dropped it and created a bunch of really sad nicks on it. Um, you know, again, anywhere where you're gonna have metal on metal rubbing, such as in here, I definitely expect to have some chipping and some wearing. Um, that's not gonna be a surprise to me if I get little chips up here, but I am actually really happy with how this looks so far. I've got my adapter base back in. Let's clear all this out of the way laying this down here so that you can see it. We have one more screw that we need to place. By lifting the handle and gently turning this, there's a channel here on the side of our large uh, shaft that goes through the entire middle of this. This screw needs to go in here in this hole and that avoids this peg piece from turning all around while we press down because it wants to do that. Um, this avoids that moving. So we will still need a little, you can either hand tighten this or do a screwdriver. I could probably get it in by hand, but a little easier to just do the screwdriver. Don't over tighten on that guy, just, just enough to keep this from rotating. And that's literally all that that does. So if we pop this back up, give it another little test and a turn. functions really nicely. And then we just have our die that goes on the bottom for the adapter and I wanna just touch, and make sure that those are just barely kissing. I really shouldn't be like smushing those down too crazy. That looks pretty good. Okay, I've zoomed you in so you can see some of the damage I made there when I dropped my handle during reassemble. So now I'm gonna do some really light touch-ups here with my can of spray paint and a small paintbrush. So we're gonna shake this guy up. I'm actually just gonna use the inside cup of uh, the inside underside of my spray paint cap. And I'm going to liberally kind of spray right here in the middle with some paint so I can get some good paint to do touch ups with. Okay, so I've got some paint there in the middle. Just gonna dip my brush and I'm gonna work, you know, pretty quick cause this is not regular acrylic paint. We're just gonna dab. There we go. I think I got all the little, all the little spots. I believe after that handle, I made my damage so much worse, but that's okay. I think in the end when it's all dry and we've got it all painted and everything again, I don't think anybody's gonna notice. I know I certainly won't. Take a little peek around here and just Make sure I got it all good. Okay, and that's it. That's all that there is to touch up. Now that you've done your touch ups, just go ahead and leave it for a bit. You know, obviously don't touch any of the areas that you just um, did and we should be good to go in about a half hour or so. And then you can just lightly spray with the clear coat or if you just did only spray paint base, you should be good to go on that. So 
I'm happy with this. I think it looks good and I'm gonna leave it to dry. Okie doke, who is ready for the final reveal of our press? I am so very happy with how this came out. I absolutely love the little sleeve. Everything works perfectly, functions great, and it looks amazing. That old press was incredibly drab and we took it from drab to fab. I am just so ecstatic about this. I have no idea if you can see the glitter and the shine, but in person it looks amazing. I am just beyond, beyond happy with this. So. Thank you so much for watching this tutorial with me. I hope that you are able to make something amazing out of your press and get it to look just absolutely amazing in your space. Thank you very much. We will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.